So this is the eventual send proposal, uh, proposing a new API, which we call Handle Promise, uh, to enable a distributed promise pipeline. Let's understand this proposal in the historical context of the promises that we have, which came in with ES6. Uh, so the history that got us to ES6 promises was that they started with the promises of the E language and the CAPTP protocol, uh, CAPTP capability transport protocol. Um, these were the first non-blocking promises. They're the direct ancestor of the promises we've got. Uh, uh, they were designed for primarily for doing uh, distributed object uh, computation, um, uh, sending remote messages to remote objects in a secure and efficient manner among uh, 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 individual units uh, which were communicating, which were event loops. So this was the communicating event loop concurrency model. Uh, JavaScript uh, is um, essentially a system of communicating event loops. Um, and the, the E uh, design first made it into JavaScript with the Waterkin Q API. The Waterkin Q API uh, then became the widely adopted variant done by Chris Kowal and Dominic Denicola, also called the Q API. Um, uh, that, um, uh, that led directly to the uh, 2011 uh, the, uh, ECMAScript Promises proposal uh, that in turn uh, turned into the, uh, the, pr the promises we have in ECMAScript 6. The system shown in white here, the, the, I'm using the white color to indicate the systems that were designed to support distributed promise pipelining. I'll be explaining shortly what promise pipelining is. But these systems that did distributed objects did it with distributed promise pipelining, uh, and they got a tremendous uh, payoff from supporting promise pipelining correctly. Uh, the reason the Q so the Q API itself didn't do distributed distributed messages, but it was built to be extensible. And Chris Kowal also wrote the Q connection extension uh, that used the extension hooks to extend it over the network in a way that did promise pipelining. The, the Q connection is colored yellow here because it was not practical for reasons that I'll get to shortly. Separately, Dean Tribble went off to Midori, I went to, sorry, went off to Microsoft and did the Midori project. And the Midori project applied the same kind of distributed asynchronous non-blocking promises with promise pipelining to do uh, really uh, quite significant large-scale systems that were very high performance and showed that this model really is a scalable model and they were reporting performance speeds up, speed ups going from a uh, system without promise pipelining to one with promise pipelining, performance speed ups between 10 and 100 on real cases. Uh, the Midori use of promises inspired the uh, async await in C sharp, which in turn inspired the, uh, the async await uh, functions that we have in ECMAScript today. Another path by which uh, the E promise design made it into JavaScript was by the twisted Python uh, library for doing uh, asynchrony, local asynchrony combined with the fool's cap protocol for doing distributed capability uh, remote messaging. Um, but this one's not colored white because uh, it didn't get promise pipelining right. Um, it didn't get promises quite right either. Uh, it led to a bunch of JavaScript work that uh, ended up being a dead end. So um, uh, enough on that. Uh, also, uh, Cap'n Proto is using the E and CAPTP um, uh, promise pipelining design and again shows that this is, uh, has a lot of very important payoff in large-scale distributed systems. Cap'n Proto is, a, uh, uh, is based on essentially protobufs uh, to do uh, distributed capability-based uh, remote messaging with promise pipelining. Okay, the reason why Q-Connection 
was not practical is also the reason why the features of the 2011 proposal um, that support distributed computing have been sitting on the shelf all this time, uh, which is the lack of weak references. If you try to do this kind of distributed object computing without weak references, you end up with a, a huge memory leak that you cannot solve. Um, uh, the bookkeeping that you have to do on each side of a connection to keep track of how you locally address a remote object, how you register a remote object so that it, so, uh, an object so that it can be remotely addressed. Those tables just grow without bound, without weak references. You cannot find out that it's safe to remove an object from those tables. Um, uh, so, uh, so the rest of this has been sitting on the shelf till now because we haven't had weak references. Now that weak references have proceeded to the point that they're inevitable, uh, it's time to revive the, the rest of the original dream. I should say, by the way, that uh, neither promises nor weak references themselves originate with E and CAPTP. It's the non-blocking promises that originate in E, and it's the weak references with our design about post-mortem finalization happening in turn boundaries that originate in E. So, um, so I want to be you know, clear about what, what I am and am not claiming originates in E itself. So the ES 2011 proposal, the, uh, the promises themselves had an extension hook in them. And they were the extension hook that was approximately the extension hook that Q Connection used to extend the Q promises across the, across the network. And our current promises don't have that extension hook. And this proposal is proposing to provide that extension hook and to provide it in a way that fits with the promises we've got, which are somewhat different than the 2011 promises. So we reworked the particulars of the API to fit into modern promises, but it's essentially the same idea. And you can think of this idea uh, as, an, as having many analog analogies to the way that we introduced proxies into ES6. Uh, in ES5, we had a bunch of internal methods that were just internal expository devices uh, to introduce uh, proxies, uh, we turned those, uh, those uh, methods uh, into things that on a proxy would cause a trap to a corresponding method on a handler so that uh, various behaviors on um, that an object would normally provide for itself, the behavior on a proxy could be provided by a handler. So we're proposing a new abstraction called a handled promise and a new constructor named handled promise uh, that uh, uh, takes some new operations, which we're also proposing, uh, and has regular promise versus handled promise differ with regard to how those new operations work. Crucial, we're not proposing to uh, change any of the behaviors of any of the existing uh, oper any, any of the existing promise API. We're not touching in particular then or catch or finally any of the existing methods on promise. Yes, Waldemar. Yeah, yeah so th this really confused me and I'm glad you explained it. I, I thought that handled uh, was a synonym for resolves. Uh, Good. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you... I thought that it was some kind of a new variant of resolve, and it's completely different, so the name really confused me. Okay, thank you. I, I, I completely did not anticipate that possible misunderstanding, so thanks for clarifying that. And, and you're exactly right. It's, it's, it's completely orthogonal. Um, both promises and... both regular promises and handled promises can be um, pending or fulfilled uh, or rejected. Uh, and, and or resolve to other promises. So, so all, all of the states of a regular promise, all of those states are also reflected in a handle promise. So with these enablers together, with the weak ref and the handle promise being the only absolute ones, hence the solid lines, but the things like the, the understanding of object IDLs from Cap'n Proto, uh, things like the ECMAScript uh, async functions, which we have, which help, uh, all of these things combined together 
to enable third-party libraries to create pleasant distributed JavaScript systems. I, we are, this proposal is not proposing a, a particular form of distributed JavaScript language, a particular interpretation of what a distributed JavaScript language is. It's, not, it's also not saying that the only use of these uh, extension points is to make a distributed JavaScript, but this is sort of the test case of adequacy of this proposal, is can you build a distributed JavaScript uh, in third-party libraries given just these extension points? Uh, and at Agoric, we have using exactly this, what we're proposing. So to give a first introduction to, to first intuition about what promise pipelining is about, I'm going to peek ahead and use, um, for expository purposes, the wavy dot syntax, which is not part of this proposal, uh, but is part of the next proposal I'll be presenting here. Uh, but the wavy dot syntax is just syntactic sugar for um, uh, uh, doing an eventual send of a message to a remote object. So the idea here uh, is that let's say the disk is a local variable that somehow represents a remote object. In particular, uh, it's a it'll it's a it's a it's a remote promise um, that uh, that designates that represents some object that's that's remote and. Uh, obviously, from the name, it's disk-like, so it, let's say it responds to an open directory message where uh, it gives you back a remote object that acts like a directory. Uh, the directory responds to an open file message. It gives you back an object that, that acts in a file-like manner that responds to a read message. And if you do this with a convention, without promise pipelining in a conventional RPC-like manner, uh, then this is three round trips. With promise pipelining, it takes advantage of the nature of promises, which is when you send off the open directory message, you immediately get back a promise for the result. It's an unresolved promise because you don't know what the result is, but you have that promise. You're sending the open file message to that promise. So if that promise, that unresolved promise, could be handled by your communication system, in such a way that it can, it can uh, serialize the open file message to be sent to the same remote destination at which the open directory message is going to be resolved. Uh, then you can, and likewise with uh, read, then you can then all three of these messages can go out without a round trip, and the entire thing is just one round trip waiting for the results of the read. So to illustrate what's going on, what's the best you can do uh, without promise pipelining, let's first of all imagine a, a classic RPC system uh, where, um, where you have blocking method calls. So uh, the, the, the line in top is clearly equivalent to the three lines below it, uh, calculating T1, T2, and T3. Um, uh, the, obviously, JavaScript doesn't have some synchronous blocking call. So what's more realistic for JavaScript would be um, uh, something like it, but using weights everywhere. Uh, and if you did it with the weights, or, li or like our weights, or you can just consider them syntactic sugar for then. So the best you can do with JavaScript today is to plumb this kind of thing together using a weights or thens. And the best you can do if you do it that way is that when you send off the uh, A message to X, what you have is an unresolved promise for the result. And any attempt to do a dot then or an await on that promise necessarily waits until we know what the result is. We, we have to wait until A gets delivered and produces a result before an await on, on P1 um, uh, which is on the third line is the important one. The await on the await on P1 has to fire before we can send the C message. Now, 
the A message sent to X and the B message sent to Y, those could proceed in parallel. Uh, but the but the crucial round trip so so this is two round trips rather than three but the round trip you can't avoid if you just use a waiter then is that p1 has to be resolved before you can you can express the sending of c2 to what it resolves to With handled promises, uh, there's the uh, again the issue of expository syntax because I haven't yet presented the API. Um, what we show here on the left is one way to write it without it without introducing new syntax using a little proxy-based helper that I'll be discussing more in the next presentation. But I think that for expository purposes, I am going to go ahead anyway and jump ahead to the wavy dot syntax. So the wavy dot syntax, the way to think of it. Is, is analogous to question mark dot. If we think of question mark dot as adjective dot, that it's like dot, but, but different somehow. Uh, wavy dot is also like dot, but different somehow. Um, uh, in particular, that um, uh, if you're sending it to a promise, you're saying this method should eventually be applied to whatever the promise ends up designating. And if the promise ends up designating a remote object, then this message should be delivered to the remote object. Um, so uh, once again, the line at the top is equivalent to the three lines at the bottom. Uh, the three lines at the bottom using our new handle promise API, once A goes out, before, even before it gets delivered, the promise that you're holding is still an unresolved promise, but it's an unresolved handled promise. Likewise with B. So while both of these are still in the air, P1 and P2 gives you the ability to name what will be the results, such that you can then do an eventual send of C to P1 and have the handling of the unresolved promise uh, handle that sending operation so that it can be serialized onto the network as well. So all of the, all three of these things can be streamed out together, uh, depending on the, the, the nature of your serialization system. They might end up just getting bundled into one network packet, but they all just go out together. Uh, and then at some later time, they start arriving on the receiving machine, where the receiving machine uh, typically, not always, will return an object local to itself, uh, T1, that returns T2, and now, um, uh, as the messages arrive, again, with no further network delays, as these mes uh, you know, the messages streamed out on the sending side, and then on the receiving side, they're streaming in, and they're, and they're typically processed one, at, one after another immediately as they're streaming in. Um, So uh, going back to the proxy analogy, uh, the way in which, in order to introduce proxies into ES6, we had to go back into the internal methods and refactor them slightly so that they were suitably defined to be virtualized by trapping to a handler. So we're doing the same thing here. Um, so these are the new internal methods that we're proposing to add to promises. Uh, and uh, like with proxies, uh, we also introduced the reflect API. So the proxies going to a handler basically lift the operation, and then the reflect API lowers the operation again. And, and the, each of the reflect methods will in turn call one of these internal methods on their first argument. Um, so likewise here, we're, these static methods are analogous to the reflect methods. They're methods on the static handled promise API. Uh, and when their first argument, their first argument must be a promise, and what the, and what they do is they simply invoke the corresponding internal method. When that method is a normal promise, uh, in which the fulfillment is a normal local object, uh, then the default behavior of the internal method is just what you would expect by the analogy between wavy dot and dot. It's basically just the postponed dot operation. So um, 
an eventual get is just doing a then on uh, the promise and then doing the, the postponed get on what the promise returns. Uh, and uh, likewise for the others, but I want to call out apply method um, is distinct from what you from any direct analogy that you see on um, on proxies and reflect, and that's because in distributed programming, by far and away the most common operation is the method call. Uh, the JavaScript uh, you know way of viewing a method call uh, locally is that it's a property lookup followed by a function invocation. Uh, that, um, that might be a fine way of looking at it locally, but in terms of facilitating a good distributed, pro distributed uh, and uh, programming experience that's also uh, reasonably efficient, uh, you really want to treat the method call as a distributed primitive. Uh, yeah, Waldemar? Uh, can prop or any of the arguments also be promises? The arguments can be promises. I had not considered prop being anything but a string or a symbol. Um, you mean property? You just mean property either. Like, the, uh, you, you just mean property, you meant to include number and other things that are valid properties. Well, the, the um, uh, I was assuming the same, okay. This is not thought out. I'm just going to tell you what was in my head. And I think with the way our shim, we have a shim for this that we're using in production at Agoric. Um, uh, I think what our shim does, uh, which is also what's in my head, is that uh, the square bracket immediately does the same coercion that the square bracket property lookup does in JavaScript, which is no matter what you give it, uh, it goes into two cases. Is it a symbol? If so, pass the symbol along and otherwise coerce it to a string. Um, but uh, since these are handled and you're talking to something that on the other side is not necessarily JavaScript um, or, or might, might be handled through other logic, it's conceivable we might want uh, to let the handler decide rather than building in a decision up front. Uh, and I had not considered that question. It's a good one to investigate in phase one. <clears throat> Okay. We add, for each of those internal methods, we add a corresponding internal method that uh, rather than being named something send is named something send only uh, with corresponding static methods, etc. And the reason for these is that uh, the send only forms are the ones that you do only for effect. So if you're not interested in the return result, if you're doing it in a context where you're going to ignore the return result anyway, uh, the fact that a JavaScript expression doesn't know whether its return result is used is no normally not terribly costly. Uh, for a distributed protocol, uh, to do all of the bookkeeping to, to thread through the returning of a return result and the resolving of a, of a remote promise when it's just going to be ignored is actually quite expensive. It's not more round trips expensive, but it's extra bookkeeping expensive. So we introduce only variants for when the result will be ignored and you're just interested in the effect. And uh, corresponding um, uh, handler traps, of course, with the, with the send only suffix. So this together is all of the handler traps. Oh, one more point about the handler traps is like with the proxy handler traps, there's a defaulting relationship. Uh, if, you, if the handler omits an only trap, then it, then it defaults to the corresponding non-only version and then just ignores the result. Um, uh, if uh, the apply method or apply method send only is absent. Uh, it defaults to a, com a composition of uh, get followed by apply function. So it does, it does sort of fall back on the uh, JavaScript notion that a method call is really a property get followed by a function call. Uh, so there's, there's a, a nice defaulting relationship among these things. 
Okay, so the promise constructor itself, there's the, on this slide, there's, this, this slide here is just a review uh, to set us up for explaining the handled promise constructor API. The promise constructor API um, uh, takes one argument, which is a function that in turn takes a resolve and a reject parameter, uh, and the promise constructor returns an, un, an unhandled promise, uh, the, an un, um, uh, and then the resolve that's given to that function argument is itself something that you give it a resolution and it, and it returns void, it doesn't return anything. Uh, and likewise reject, you give it a reason, it doesn't reject anything. What resolve and reject do is they simply change the state of the promise from pending to, to, to fulfilled or from pending to rejected or from, from uh, pending uh, directly to pending indirectly uh, because it's following some other promise. If you resolve one promise to another promise. Um, uh, so that's why I say resolve of resolution rather than resolve of fulfillment because you can resolve a promise to another promise. The handled promise API adds um, two new, um, right, adds uh, two new parameters, both of which are optional, and if both of them are left out, then the semantics you get is exactly the semantics of the promise constructor. Uh, one of the things that has been uh, raised a few times, uh, which we can certainly consider an open uh, phase one question, stage one question, uh, is since handled promise devolves to the meaning of promise if you omit the optional parameters, should we actually introduce a new class or should we just add these optional parameters to promise? Uh, I feel pretty strongly that we should not add the optional parameters to promise because uh, JavaScript's looseness with arity makes it very hazardous to add arity to existing API. Um, but it's, I can cert you know, certainly, if, if um, I'm happy to, to re-examine that question during phase one. Um, the, the unresolved handle, the unfulfilled handler, uh, is the thing that handles the promise in, while it's in an unfulfilled state. So as you do these various eventual send operations on the promise, if it's a handled promise with an unfulfilled handler, what happened? It's still showing on the screen here. Oh, there it is. Good. It's back. Um, uh, that, the, that the traps on the unfulfilled handler get invoked while the handled promise is in an unfulfilled state. Um, uh, in order to uh, transition the promise from being in an unfulfilled state to something else, uh, you can call resolve or reject on it, which uh, has exactly the, the, the current meaning, or uh, you can call back resolve with presence, which is a bit peculiar, um, uh, it, it, and it took us a while to refine this into something that met all the constraints. Um, uh, resolve with presence, you give it back a presence handler, and it gives you back a fresh empty object, the kind of object that would be made by uh, object.create of null, an object with uh, no own properties, no prototype, and fully mutable. So it's just an object that you can, that the, that the code using resol uh, resolve with presence can mutate pretty much into what it wants, but the key thing is that it's fresh. Um, uh, and uh, the reason why, the reason why uh, we need the, to introduce the concept of a presence is I'm going to back up to uh, this slide over here. Uh, yeah, let's do that slide over there. So at this point, P1 is a fulfilled promise. If you did a then on P1, the then should fire. 
uh, the then has to call its callback with the fulfilled value. But the fulfilled value is t1. The fulfilled value isn't here. It's elsewhere. So how can you call the local callback with t1? Well, you can't. So the presence is a, remote, is a local representative of the remote object. So that's the local representative that's provided uh, to the success callback of the then. Okay. Um, uh, can I can I have an extra ten minutes? There are no objections. You can extend for ten minutes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so we do have a shim. We're using the shim in production. Uh, if we can do it with a shim in production. Why aren't we? Why do? Why do we need to come to the committee? Why do we need a new platform feature? Why do we need special help for the platform? Well, there's one hard case that we have not been able to solve, and and I've managed to convince myself that it's probably unsolvable, uh, purely from a library, uh, which is uh, consider this piece of code. On line two, we create a new normal platform promise that's starting off in an unresolved state. On line three, we do an eventual send to it of the message foo. Um, uh, conceptually, this is uh, buffering the eventual send in the promise. What the shim does is it uses a weak map to, to keep bookkeeping in a side table associated with the identity of the promise for buffering the message. But it's basically buffering the message that should be delivered to whatever the promise comes to designate. So now it's sitting there in a local promise. Now we create this handled promise Q with an unfulfilled handler. And Q is now a handled unfulfilled promise at this stage. Uh, if you did an eventual send to Q, that eventual send should get handled by the unfulfilled handler and sent over the network. Now the last line resolves P to Q. So the semantics that we want is that all of the messages that were buffered in P now get forwarded to Q, and in this case, turn into a trap on Q's unfulfilled handler so they can get sent out over the network. Uh, we can certainly override in our shim, we could monkey patch uh, the, you know, the, the, um, the promise constructor to, to, to in order to monkey patch the, res the resolve that's provided in the callback, uh, we could pro we could monkey patch the you know a bunch of things, but it's really not feasible to by monkey patching intercept every place in the spec that the that the that the that JavaScript resolves a local promise, uh, in particular because of async functions and await. It's just not feasible to to intercept all resolves. Waldemar, I'm confused by this. Uh... Wouldn't PR be undefined uh, uh, the, on the last line? Ah, on the second line, uh, the promise constructor is, is storing into PR the, um, the resolver of, of it P. It should just be a function call is all. PR is a function, not an object with a resolve function. That's oh! But otherwise it's... Oh, oh, I'm sorry, yes. It should be PR open paren Q, exactly. Um, yes, I was, I was uh, this slide is incorrect. Um, uh, so PR is the resolver for the promise P that's stored by the promise constructor on line two. Okay, and, and the last line should just be a function call. Um, uh, but in any case, what, uh, uh, if, if, the, if the local promise P is resolved in a way that we cannot intercept, then the message foo, the eventual message foo, is sitting languishing in that promise when it should have been pipelined over the network. And eventually, we still have, the shim still provides the invariant that ever, every message ever sent is eventually delivered ac exactly once to the, the object that the promise designates. Um, uh, so, um, but, uh, but that, in this case, 
in our shim will depend on the then firing, which means that you're waiting on the round trip you were trying to avoid. And not only have you lost promise pipelining, you're also getting a very counterintuitive message order. One of the things that's important in doing distributed programming is to be very careful about uh, predictable orders of message delivery. Um, and this, this disrupts both of those. Um, and um, now I'll stop recording and take further questions.